they're going live. You are live. So we are live now. All right. Can you go, Kelsey? <laughs> <laughs> we are live. People, like the the world is listening to you, Kelsey. Okay. Hello. Hello and welcome, welcome. We are so excited to be able to offer this webinar today. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kelsey O'Brien. I'm one of the co-directors at MK Envision Galleries uh, and have been lucky enough to be part of it from the beginning in 2016. And we have had the pleasure of working with many talented local San Diego fine art photographers over the last four years. Uh, one of which is joining us today, Diego Lapatina. Say hi, Diego. Hello, people. <laughs> Hello. And I'm actually just going to share a little bit about what's going on with the gallery as we sort of wait for more uh, people to join us before we get into the meat and potatoes. Um, so mm, probably by assumption, um, for those who don't know, the gallery is closed temporarily. It's not an essential business, uh, though it is to us, right? <laughs> it totally is. Yeah, I think that's a great... I think it's an important... <laughs> But, yes. you know. Right. So um, though we are not open to the public currently, we are still offering private consultations for those who are interested in viewing art uh, or who want to see something in person. And we also offer our entire collection online at mkenvision.com. We actually have each of the fine art photographers we have represented over the last four years. We had only so many represented in the gallery, but we have a much larger collection of each of theirs on our online store. So we always encourage people to check out our larger collections there. Um, Kelsey, and actually, how many, yes. how many art artists do you guys have worked with so far? So far, we have worked with 11, I believe. 11? 11, and now plus five, because the group show that you are part of uh, added five more. So that would be 16 now. Nice. Yeah. And the format we usually follow is uh, when we don't do group shows is each term or quarter at the gallery is um, a three month uh, exhibit. And so we'll typically do four shows a year. And so <laughs> the math adds up to 11 so far. <laughs> uh, nice. Yeah. So, um, and also, I wanted to say, as we're waiting for a few more people to join us, that uh, though these are definitely uncharted waters for most businesses like our own, the technology that we have today and this other form that we can communicate with one another is so amazing. And we're very fortunate that we live during a time where we can, uh, you know, focus our energies to uh, online and growing our community that way uh, alongside as we wait patiently for this quarantine to lift. <laughs> so it's true. And, okay. I, and I think one, like before people would have excuses, right? Oh no, uh, I cannot work remotely or, but this quarantine actually works really well to show that we can, if, if it's necessary, we find ways to communicate and be part of like a community. And I think this is like a beautiful thing about technology. I, I like a few years later, I, I remember people just complaining about technology. Oh, how technology is isolating people in their old cocoons. But now it, we are seeing the power of this. And I always believe that mm -hmm. technology has this really amazing power, power of connecting people and letting people interact. So I think now we can see that too, right? In your own business. Right. Oh, absolutely. And Though, as I mentioned, during these uncharted times, we don't know how long our doors will have to be closed. Uh, it is forcing us to spend a lot more effort building our online presence and online community, which will only help us in the long run. So we're, we're looking at this time as uh, a blessing in disguise, we hope, as far as the business goes. Uh, but we shall see how, how things pan out. So, yeah. I, yeah. I agree with you. Yes. It is uncertain times, but we always have to look. I, I'm this eternal 
optimistic. I always try to look for the bright side in every situation. Because mm. we see so many bad news if you turn on your on your local news and everything is always such like so many bad news and mm. and I understand it's a really terrible time in our society, but I wanna be that person that oh, if someone's really down I try to bring this people this person up because mm. otherwise it's gonna be really hard to deal with this all of this craziness that's happening, right? Absolutely. It's a time we can all come together help those in need in creative ways since we can't physically be there. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. We personally, I have found my family is actually connecting to distant family members that we haven't spoken with in a while. And in a strange way, it's bringing some of our community closer together uh, just because yeah. a lot of the busyness and the, the rat race, if you will, has been forced to end abruptly. It's, it's providing different ways to connect and different opportunities to connect. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. It, it's definitely a time we'll all look back on and look at the good, the bad, and hopefully come, come out ahead is, is the hope. Yeah. And it is funny because yesterday uh, I was talking with this friend of mine and he, he was telling me, I'm so busy. I'm busier than I was before. And I mm -hmm. think that is because we have so many stuff that we, we usually put back because we are always busy, like working and stuff. So there's so many small projects we have to do. Mm -hmm. And this is giving like this time that we cannot go outside. It's giving us the opportunity to, uh, it's giving us the, an opportunity to just really get all these projects, those little projects up and running, right? I know that at least for me, I have been working so many different projects and as, once again, it is a terrible time, and I'm sorry for everyone that actually has someone that's suffering with this. But I think the the take home message is like try to take like try to try to use this time to create something positive because this is gonna end sooner or later. This is gonna end, right? And once this is if this comes to the end, we can actually just uh, move forward. Be ahead. Yeah, we can yeah. be ahead of where we were. Right. Very true. Okay, so now that we have a little uh, group joining us, I think we can start uh, start in on it. So yeah. um, for those who are just joining us, um, my name is Kelsey O'Brien. I am one of the co-directors at MK Envision Galleries, and we are joined today by Diego Lapatina, one of our current featured photographers. And we're just so excited Hello. that Diego has the technology uh, savvy to get this started. And um, it took a lot of effort, but uh, we're so grateful for him. Like he was mentioning the projects he wanted to tackle. This is one of them is webinars. <laughs> so sure. without further ado, uh, let's get into it. So Diego, tell us for those who don't know a little bit about your background. Where are you from? How long have you lived in San Diego? Okay, but before I, I go ahead, I want to say a few things that were not in the script. And Kelsey, <laughs> you know that I always love doing this stuff. Okay. Uh, uh, first of all, I'm really grateful for everyone that signed up to this and decide to share their time with us. And I think that some people believe like people might have different perspectives in life. For su success for some people might be having money or being wealthy. For me, success is to be able to share my passion and the knowledge that I have gathered during my, my journey. And you guys giving your time, it is a way for me to share. And this is like a value that I hold dear to my heart. I really think that sharing and connecting with people and being open and helping other people is something very important for me. On this note, I'm extremely happy to have found Kelsey and Michelle because they have been so receptive to my crazy idea to make a webinar. I took so much of their time creating this and they were always there, okay, very patiently. Diego, I think that would be better. I think that other way would be better. So thank you, ladies. I really appreciate this. I really appreciate everyone watching this. And I'm happy to have found you too. 
So with all of that out of my plate, I'm going to start talking about myself. Well, <laughs> as Kelsey said, my name is Diego, and I was born and raised in Brazil. Brazil is a really cool city. I, I It's a really cool country. The city that I, was, that I grew up is called Santos. That was a really cool city. I had a beach like two blocks from me, which is pretty similar to San Diego, but it was very different from Canada, Alberta the place that I moved in 2008. So in 2008, I moved to Canada to, to pursue a few personal projects. And I really loved the landscape there. It was a beautiful, beautiful, like I, I used to live in Alberta, which is, and was pretty close to the Canadian Rockies. And it was just amazing. Uh, the, the mountains, the lakes, uh, the nature, the forest, I was in love with that place. Mm -hmm. And I call Alberta moral, I, I call Alberta my house, my home for 10, 10 to 11 years. And from there, I moved to San Diego to keep pursuing my, my goals, my professional goals and my dreams and everything. And I have been calling San Diego home for the, la the past two years. And mm -hmm. I love this place too. Uh, so, yes, my name is Diego, Brazil, Canada, <laughs> San Diego now. <laughs> so you've definitely lived in some beautiful landscape surroundings. Um, so I imagine that probably inspired some of your uh, landscape photography and what kind of drew you in to photography? It definitely did. I mean, I started, like, I started taking photos as soon as someone get, I think photography has this power that either you love photography and you're gonna do photography for a very long time. And I tried to deny this for a long, for a very long time. I said, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna be a, a photographer. I'm not gonna even, I'm not even gonna give a try in being a photographer. But there is people that really love photography, they are gonna have this push towards doing it. And there are other people that like photography, but they like scene photography, the art of photography, right? So for me, it started, the, the, the love for photography started back in when I was maybe 12, 13 years old. And my uncle gave me the first film camera. And I had, I know I had probably 12, 24 poses. And I, I remember snapping a lot of photos. And I went to this, uh, to the to store to develop the film, the, the, the film and I have those little images on my hand. And that was like, wow, this is such a power, powerful tool. I can freeze time and keep this as a memory for the rest of my life. So that was like, I was hooked. And after finishing my pharmacy degree, I decided to, to buy my first like point and shoot camera. It was a digital camera. And I had that little camera with me all the time. I would go everywhere with that camera. At the time I was doing my master's degree in Sao Paulo, so I had this camera and I was just snapping photos of everyone, everything, but it was pretty much a snapshot. And from the snapshot to try to capture something more meaningful, I think that happened when I moved to Canada and I started to see all those images, right? Like all those sceneries. Like I, I walked through the parks, like I said, wow, look, this is so beautiful. I wish I could actually capture not only the image, but how I feel. And this is when I did the lip. So I, I, I start to learn like more deeply about the technical part, the, the artistic part of photography. And from there, this just keep evolving. And when I got here in San Diego, I'm just trying to Spend my arsenal in photography and learning about like how to how to capture beautiful seascapes and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. for sure, it had an impact moving to Canada. Very nice. Uh, so, I actually wanted to see if we could do your slideshow. Uh, we'd love to see your work for those who aren't familiar and kind of get an idea of that beautiful uh, Alberta that you speak of. <laughs> yeah. So this is. Uh, I'm going to share with you guys four images that I actually are part of my portfolio with MK Vision. So this is the first one. It is called Crescent Falls. This is uh, in, the, in the province of Alberta. It's not even inside any park. So the drive to this location is pretty easy. 
and to arrive to this spot is just uh, maybe like less than a mile, half a mile to arrive to this spot. But the view, this view specifically, was a happy accident. I I actually got lost, and I was doing trail jumping tree logs with this friend of mine. And when we looked backwards, we saw this, and I was like, "Wow, this is a really good image." So I set up my camera and just snapped this image, this image, and I was hoping that would work well. And when I got home and working on it, it's just it was mind blowing. I really like this image. So this one is from Washington State. So this was my, uh, this is from my, sorry, I was just reading the comments. Uh, this is from my last trip to Washington State. Uh, and when I, this was a very, that was a lucky image, I would say. I was not planning on this in this image, but as soon as I step outside my car and I start to walk, towards the, the final destination, which was the second beach, I saw this like this light coming through, piercing through the, the trees. And I was like, oh, this is a perfect opportunity to capture this image. So I started running around and I set my camera and I, I, I snapped so many shots from there because I was afraid that I would not be able to capture what I was feeling at the time. And in the camera, to be honest, in the back of my camera, I was like, oh, this is not good. So I kept doing it and doing it and doing it. But this was like maybe three minutes. This just lasts for three minutes. So I, okay, hopefully I got something. And I walked to the beach and once I got back home, I love getting back home after a travel trip because I always surprised with stuff that I get. So this is, a, the, this is the last image that I got before the pandemic. Uh, this is, I took this image in La Jolla and you can, we can see the Pierce, the Pierce Crips Pier it's Crips beer. And it's just a beauty. Well, I was not expecting to see this. And when I saw it, I was like, wow, that's like, San Diego has some really beautiful place to explore. And hopefully once we go over this virus, I'm going to be able to see more of this. Saptuka. Uh, this is another one from San Diego. Is a, is a structure. Just let's say is a structure. <laughs> and uh and i just love like how the light it was the sun sunrise and i just love how the light the golden light was like illuminating this structure and and the long exposure really accentuates this and you might not understand why i'm saying structure but this is an internal joke and we might yeah, might or might not share that in the future <laughs> You, you won't, Kelsey. Okay, I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, we had a little, uh, Diego, English is not his first or second language. He informed Michelle and I, and um, yeah, the lifeguard tower term was escaping him when we were doing a, a practice of this, and it definitely got my funny bones. We're going to move on before bad things happen with uh, <laughs> losing my composure. So thank you for sharing. Uh, so... So what I would like to know, so I love hearing about a little, you touched on it, but your motivation, uh, what is it about photography? Like what, I know you said you like capturing a point in time and that really kind of struck you at, uh, in your younger days, uh, but what is it now? What is it that really gets you excited and gets you to plan trips where you're lugging your bag at four in the morning up a mountain? And you know, what, what is it about it that's so addicting to you? I will answer you, Kelsey, but before moving forward, mm -hmm. for everyone watching this, you can actually ask questions here on the chat and we will get to those uh, questions as soon as we see those. So if you have any questions for me or for Kelsey, just let us know and we can definitely also talk about this moving forward. Mm -hmm. But to answer Kelsey's question, uh, I think everything about photography is amazing. Uh, I started photography because I was like, when I saw this little piece of paper and I was able to freeze like a slice of time, I was in love with it. But nowadays, 
nowadays is just being able to, you know, explore like the camera. My camera is actually, I, I like to say my camera is my passport and it, allow, it allows me to be a tourist in any place I go. So sometimes we are walking in our own cities and we, we go to, I don't know, like a mall or like a beach and we don't stop to see, uh, we don't we don't give an, the uh, the the proper attention to small details. And when you have the camera with you, usually you have to stop and see. And we're always looking for this, right? And this is what I love about photography: is just how it allows me to be very obvious, uh, observant to everything that's around me. So, mm. yeah, I love going for trips and like exploring, and hiking. But for me, photography, the love for, the, for photography is from everything, from the moment I sit on my chair and I started planning a trip or the moment that I'm editing an image and or the moment that I'm going to capture a photo in my backyard. You know, it's, uh, it's just something that I would like to do. It's a, it's a creative way to express myself. And, yeah, I, I, I'm always... I'm super excited. Anytime we talk about photography, I get super excited. And I really like, and one thing that I really believe is that is nice about photography is that you can actually have, we can, you have control of little, you don't have control about everything, but the things you have control, you can really try to adapt to yourself. So once you capture an image, you can go home and you can edit that image to make it feel like you. Right, and you can put your feelings in that image. And once you have this, you're gonna have that image forever. And after years doing photography, I just I I was watching all those images on my screen. I was like, wow, oh, man, this is good. But what are you gonna do with this? So I actually I made my first book. I I did a book for like a for for the family, a yearbook, right, with the image. And I started to learn about design. And from there, I said, oh, this I like to have this in my hand. So I bought my printer. And I start printing image, so it's just something that keep is always evolving, and always creating new outlets for me to be creative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so fun working with professional uh, photographers, well, all levels really, um, who really have a passion for it because it seems that there's a lot of people. Interestingly enough, um, professional landscape photographers we have worked with have a completely different background. In fact, you are a scientist, correct? Yes, you're right. Yes. And I want to say, Michelle and I were shocked when we realized, I think approximately 50% of the photographers we have worked with so far have a science background. And so there's, you know, the technical side, because of course, photography has a large technical side. However, the creative outlet that it offers and the art let it, unleashing your brain to the artistic process and getting lost in discovery and whatnot, I think has just immense appeal to those who need to balance out their life. You know, I, yeah. I feel like the science realm is quite on one side and the art side is quite on the other. And photography sort of brings the both together in a way. And, and I, I would agree with you, but it is, I will I was I was trying to draw a parallel between photography and and science, and one thing that we both are extremely technical. Photography is extremely technical, and science you have to follow the protocol, otherwise you're not gonna get your result. Mm -hmm. And you also have to be extremely creative in science, mm -hmm. because usually you're looking for an answer of for something that no one actually knows. I'm all. Mm -hmm. Like during my, during my, since we already know I'm a scientist, during my PhD, I work in trying to learn how genes are regulated inside the cell. Mm. So it, it was new. Nobody knew how that would happen. And through years of experiments and thinking creative and thinking outside the box, I, I, I was able to discover this new structure inside of a cell and it was, wow, that's really cool. But it's like I, I had to use my creativity to imagine and to test. And that's for me is very similar to photography. Mm -hmm. When I'm snapping a photo, I think, okay, like at the beginning, I was snapping, a, I was creating an image. And the goal was to see that in the, in the screen. 
but after a while, after I bought my printer, I was like, okay, like how are gonna how are gonna print this? What's gonna be the best way to show this to the world? And so the, my process of creating an image actually changed quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So is this gonna be a black and white image or it's gonna be a color uh, colorful image? Is it gonna be a glossy paper? Is it gonna be a matte paper? So mm -hmm. all of this start to play around and it's just uh, it's an endless loop, I guess. <laughs> It's a, it's a definitely a science experiment unto itself, <laughs> creating an image from start to f finish. So um, we're getting some great questions on the site. And before we get to those, so feel free to keep adding them. Um, we'll just continue a little bit further with the discussion and then we'll start answering the questions. So, um, but you touch on it a little bit. Um, I just love how you talk about um, we got a question prior to this, um, something like, where is the best, it's actually related to a question we just got, um, not many places in the world are perfect for photography. Do you agree? Is there a specific technique needed to make a place look interesting? And before you dig into that one, uh, the question it reminds me of is, where is the perfect first place to go out and capture photos when you're just learning? And you mentioned that you, the camera gives you the opportunity to become an explorer in your own neighborhood. And like you said, it's your passport and it, wherever you go with it, you're discovering and um, creating as you go. And it's not, not as much focused on the location uh, as it is what you see where you are. Yeah. Um, so can you yeah. touch on that a little more? Yeah, sure. So to answer uh, the person that was talking about it is now, I don't even remember the question, I just remember like vaguely because I'm trying to pay attention to different stuff. But the, what is the, not every place is a beautiful, not many places in the world is, are pe perfect for photography, do you agree? Frames of a life blog. I would probably agree, but it's not totally. I would say we are, we should force ourselves to find beauty in every place we go. I, I do, I, I'm, I'm adept to this. So I have traveled to a few places that I'm gonna tell you, I say, last year I was working, just to give you a little bit of background. Last year I was working as a, as a business development manager. So I was traveling a lot and I went to a few places. I was asking myself, what am I doing here? It was not super, was not the most, uh, pleasing, like aesthetically, aesthetically speaking. But if you stop and you slow down, it, not, it, can not be, it might not be the beautiful landscape that we are used to, or it might not be the beautiful mountain in the lake, but it might be a nice, you know, like graffiti, or it might be a beautiful uh, image of, of people interacting. So as a photographer, I don't, really believe that it's like honestly sometimes I feel I, I feel like I'm like right now I feel like I'm cheating a little bit here in San Diego because it's so easy to go and just take a beautiful image on the coast but before in Alberta I would have to hike maybe 10 12 15 miles to get one image so I would have to put a lot of work on it <laughs> and now it's it, so yeah it's, it, of course we want to find those beautiful perfect uh, image that actually is almost you just have to set up your camera and just do it but I always looking for the beauty in the places that we are not expecting and that's when I'm really happy about it so mm -hmm. walking to my camera around my neighborhood even now we are not allowed to go outside so how what do you do right I'm not gonna I'm, I'm not gonna stop taking photos so I'm creating stuff inside of my place inside of my home so it's coffee beans. I'm taking photos of coffee beans, <laughs> small Lego figure actions and stuff like that. Because <laughs> creativity should, you all should be pumping your, your creative uh, juices mm -hmm. through your body. Because otherwise you kind of just lose it. <laughs> so yeah, I think yeah, like- that's, that's actually one of our mottos at MK Envision Galleries is finding beauty in your backyard. 
And, yeah. you know, it's quite literal, it has a literal meaning right now is, you know, what is literally right around you in your own neighborhood or block or actual backyard, you know, it's, we're a little more limited right now. And actually, we got a question. Uh, are there places you want to photograph, but cannot currently due to political safety and general safety? So this is a really, really good question. I coming from Brazil, it is not the safest place. There's a lot of places in Brazil you can go and you can take images and have no problem at all. But uh, there are a few places you always have to be aware. So I'm gonna give you an example. Last year I went to Mexico City three times, and mm -hmm. the first time I went to Mexico City, I was a little bit afraid because people say it's a super uh, it, it can be dangerous, and I bring, I just brought my little, I just brought my little point and shoot camera, and that was it. And I was walking around, and I was like, oh, this is not, it's not, it is, this can be like I understand that some parts of the city might be more dangerous than other parts of the city, but the place that I was exploring as a tourist, it was pretty safe. I was feeling extremely safe. So the second time around, I brought my camera. I didn't bring my, uh, my. I would say I didn't bring my A top gears. I brought my, my second body and lenses that is not as expensive. But I was walking around with my camera and I, I was shooting pretty much everywhere. And it didn't have any problems, any troubles. And actually I felt really safe. So sometimes it's, it can be quite deceiving to just like I, I first of all if you're traveling you should definitely do some insurance for your gear you don't want to get outside and go to other country and be robbed in just little second of five mm -hmm. ten thousand dollars in camera gear so look for a camera gear insurance that's very important and if something happens you just give away and that's fine but sometimes it's also important to not just read everything all that is being uh, published in the media because it could be very different. Different countries going to have different uh, feelings and inside each country you might actually have different feels too. So I went to uh, uh, Minneapolis too and I was in this Uber driver and the Uber driver was telling me, oh, this is a very, this is a very dangerous neighborhood. You should not be walking here. That is done. I was like, wow, that sounds really dangerous. And mm -hmm. the conference that I was, happens to be really close to the location and I decide to just walk there explore with my with the camera and yes I I was not feeling 100% safe but I didn't find any trouble so sometimes you have to be careful you have to go with your gut feeling and respect but there is always ways to explore so I'm actually I really want to go to Pakistan and it takes me take, taking image there, and it's a plan. It's a plan that I have in my life. And to do this, I have people from Pakistan that I talk to, and locals, and they usually give you like, the, the indications where you can go, where you cannot go, what is a safe place, and what is not a safe place. So there's a, like there's different aspects of this, but definitely, if you're traveling, look for like a gear insurance, photography insurance. Because this is, I think that's the worst thing that can happen, right? Like, no, I, I, no, well, I realize that many, <laughs> many other worst bad things can happen. Physical, hopefully, personal harm would probably be worse than yeah, you. Exactly right. Right. I was like, I'm when I a, said, I'm not a photographer, so I don't know what photographers would no, say. <laughs> no, I, and I, I agree with you. That, but for me, I, I, I always feel, I have this. I think even this, my optimistic personality just goes like way beyond. I said, what is the worst can happen? Ah, Jill was going to rob my camera. And I realized it can be a lot worse than this, but hopefully nothing of that's going to happen. I so, think that's a good as, tip though, is yeah, get, get gear insurance and do as much homework as you can. I think uh, speaking with locals, if it is a place that might be, um, you know, any sort of political stuff going on or whatnot, um, doing your homework with speaking with locals, that's a great tip that I don't know if many people would initially think to do. So, And, and nowadays with Instagram, it's, it's kind of easy to connect with people from different countries, mm -hmm. right? You can just 
connecting and asking people, hey, is this location okay to go and shoot, mm -hmm. uh, do some shooting? Or do you know anyone around? Do you know a group of photographers? Because usually if you are group with a group of photographers, you're a little bit more safe mm -hmm. than, you, than you, if you're by yourself, right? So mm -hmm. there's ways to mediate this. And uh, I would say if don't like, don't do anything too crazy. Try to be on the safe side. Listen to your body, listen to your gut feeling. Sometimes that's the first indication that something is wrong. So I would not say, oh, well, you, you should go to Syria on the war zone and try to do photography there. That might be a little bit too risky, but always do your homework. Mm, good. Okay, so now to get a little technical, we have a question from Borrowed Light Photography. Uh, what's your favorite lens for landscape photography? And actually, you were going to actually give us a peek at some of the gear that you carry with you at all times. Um, but yeah, so to start, what is your favorite lens? Yes, right now, my favorite lens for landscape photography is this guy. It's a 1635 millimeters. Uh, I didn't, because I'm a landscape photographer, I just buy f4 I'm, I, I don't have to use the f2.8 so i just got into that 16 to 35 millimeters is f4 i love this lens it creates really beautiful sharp image and this is probably on my camera for around more than 70 percent of the time this is like the main go to mm -hmm. so after this one i go to the other extreme so if i see a lens uh, uh, a wildlife animal or if I see a mountain that I want to zoom in, I have my, the big beast, I call, I call this the big beast. It's a, this feels like a tank. I dropped this lens a couple of times and it doesn't even do a dent. It's oh. really solid. It's a solid <laughs> lens. This is as solid as it comes. But don't try that uh, at home, probably. Don't try that at home. It might actually break. I, I yeah. didn't drop on purpose, I promise. So this is a 70 to 300 uh, L series from Canon, also produced amazing sharp image uh, and it's really nice when you want to do a close-up in a, in a subject like a mountain or like a wildlife and from there I have other few lenses that I carry with me for a special purpose so I have a macro lens with my 100 so if I like walking on the like it's a cloudy day and there's nothing I can do like I, I'm gonna look for a macro I'm gonna look for a small mushroom or flowers so this is when I use my macro. This is uh, 2.8, which is also allowed me to shoot in low light situations. Mm -hmm. And it has like a very narrow depth of field. So I love this one. Mm -hmm. uh, I have another one, which is my 50 millimeters. Everyone should have a 50 millimeters in the backpack. It doesn't have to be a fancy Sigma or whatever, uh, Canon 1.2. And the 50 millimeters of Nifty 50 are actually extremely affordable. And this, that was the first lens that I bought. It mm -hmm. was a, a Canon 1.8. I paid 200 bucks. The image quality was amazing. And it's really good to get learning, get, like, get to learn like how to take photos, a really nice lens. So the 50 millimeters, and this is my camera. This is the, the camera that I call my A kit. So this is a 5DS. Uh, it's a 50 megapixel lens. It has a 24 uh, lens on it. It's a 1.4. So I usually I use this lens a lot for night photography and uh, in situation low light situation. Mm -hmm. Produce really amazing images as well. And last but not least, and maybe more important of all, is a tripod. If you're in landscape photography, you need a good solid tripod. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you might run in trouble. I remember my first trip, uh, let's say my first international trip to take photos. It was to Seattle. And when I got to Seattle, I went to, to this beautiful place to see I, what I have, like this nice view from the city skyline and the mountain. I think it's Olympic Mountain. I don't remember the name of the mountain. Oh, Mount Rainier was in the background. And I was like, wow, that's beautiful. I'm going to take this image. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do a panorama. And it's going to be awesome. 
And then I did all of this, but my tripod was not very solid and it was windy. So I got home, I have this motion blur in all of my images. I maybe save one of those. So wow. a solid tripod should be one of your first purchases when you <laughs> get into landscape photography. So that is the perfect uh, tie in. We have a question from V. Have you ever encountered a moment where you had a total vision in your mind, but the camera could not execute in the way you wanted? That sounds <laughs> like what you experienced, yeah. but that was due to the tripod. I think V is asking more in terms of, uh, yeah, just the vision you have yeah. and not being able translating, to execute. Yeah. Translating whatever I was seeing there. Yes, yeah, that happened. Uh, and that happened more than one time, uh, I believe. Mm -hmm. Once, like, I, I think something very important to know is that every image you're gonna see on my on my Instagram or on my website, it is uh, it is how is my interpretation of that place, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say the, what this captures, what my camera captured, the raw file is not gonna look the same as what I post because just the uh, what comes out of my camera is just the ne digital negative. So the feelings and what I was, what actually draw my attention is all part of my post-processing. Mm. But this can be extremely hard. This, like many, many times I have looked at to something, say, how are you going to capture this? And it doesn't work. It didn't work. But the more you practice and the more you study, the more you read, the more you research, and the more you go out and the more you fail. Like fail is a huge, is a huge part of photography at mm. least. Maybe just for me, but like I have failed so many times in capturing something that it's just made me, okay, I'm going to have to research how I'm going to be able to see this, how I'm going to improve my way to capture uh, a sun on the frame. So there's always ways to work, but I have seen many images that I was not able to translate in a, in a photography and I have failed many, many times in creating something that I believe would be beautiful. And actually, we uh, we will be sending out a survey, I, I may have already mentioned this, in the coming day or two. Uh, and we'd love to hear feedback from those who are listening in on what you enjoyed, what you want to hear more of, uh, what we should leave out. <laughs> we really want honest feedback since this is the first time we're doing this. Uh, but that said, this is more of a general Q&A uh, but we are working with Diego to uh, come up with some more targeted, focused webinars on specific photography topics uh, and also technical uh, workshops. So that was something that some of you may have <laughs> RSVP'd for and unfortunately had to cancel it because uh, our first technical photography workshop was canceled due to the coronavirus uh, and it was going to be in person at the gallery. So we're working on bringing that, um, developing a whole series of technical workshops once we reopen the gallery and also offer more webinars about specific uh, photography related topics. So yeah, please give us feedback uh, when we send out the survey. Um, so, okay, new, new we question. We would appreciate it. Oh, yes. <laughs> So new question, um, how important is having the right gear? Uh, would you say it's more important to have the right gear or the right eye? Uh, definitely the right eye. Gears are just a tool to make something happen. If you're not able to have the right eye, you're never gonna see this stuff. I actually think that too many gears might actually be a problem. The more options you have, the more distract you're gonna get. And the more, in the last, you're gonna be, fo be able to focus. So there's cases of photographers that are just, they made the careers using just like 24 millimeters length. Or mm -hmm. uh, just, I, there's people on Instagram that made their, like their whole career, really prolific careers, just using an iPhone. So mm -hmm. it's all about, having a vision and getting this vision to uh, to to work with whatever you have in, like in that moment how many like I don't I don't know how many times I have uh, so let's let me put this example 
I, I like mountain running. Like, and I was running and I didn't have my camera, but I have my, 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 my cell phone with me. And my cell phone has a camera. So I, is this the best image that would probably would be able to capture? Probably not, but it was what I had with me. So you adapt mm -hmm. to whatever you have with you at the time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, some stuff might be more complicated to do this. So if you're shooting Northern Lights or I don't know, low light situation, that'd be harder to do this with like, if, if you don't have the specific gear, but that's not gonna be, that's gonna, this does not, this does not translate whether you're a good photographer or not. What translates if you're a good photographer or not is how good are you to sense the scene and see the details that other people might not be able to see it. So the right eye is definitely more important than the right gear, for, in my opinion, at least. I think we've heard this more than once. The best camera is the camera you have in your hand. Yep, exactly. <laughs> and speaking of gear... Uh, one of those workshops I was mentioning, uh, we will be having one based completely on camera gear basics. And um, Diego will kind of go over yeah, the myths and what is essential, what isn't, uh, and just kind of for those who are uh, wanting to get started, that would be a great class to sign up for. Sure. So let's see. Um, in your opinion, Diego, what is the right balance between taking a good photo versus photoshopping a good photo? I just have to say really quickly. Thank you, Sean. Sean's one of my friends in Alberta, and he told me he would make an effort to be here. Thank you. Uh, and I, I'm glad you didn't ask about the photosynthesis in the camera. That would be like way too geeky. But for this answer, I'm gonna uh, <laughs> say it's a fine balance. I think photo, like uh, a good image, you're not gonna have to spend too much time in photoshopping it. Uh, mm -hmm. I think Photoshop has its own merits. You, you create, a, it's almost like a painting, right? Photoshop, it can work like, like a painting. You can create, you can create a digital image. You can get the moon from one image and the sky from another image and the, back, uh, the background from another image and a tree from another image and make a composite. And so I don't think, as a photographer, I do use Photoshop, but it's just in hands and try to translate what I felt at the time into the image that I capture. So sometimes I make something brighter I make a specific region of an uh, image brighter than the other uh, regions, or I clone out some imperfections that happen with my camera, but I try to keep as real as possible. So if I show you the image that I capture, you're gonna be able to connect those two. Mm -hmm. So I try to, I, and listen, there's many people, there's many Photoshop artists are out there. They create amazing work, amazing body of work. But for me, I just try to, use the Photoshop as a way to enhance whatever image I have there. Mm -hmm. It's a tool to bring out the vision you had, really. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, very nice. Okay, let's see. Um, I actually have been getting a few questions via Facebook Messenger. Um, so, okay, what is the perfect day? I think they're, they mean in terms of weather. What is the perfect weather for a, as a photographer yeah well the perfect weather my dream day would start with like uh some clouds in the sky moving really fast and this very colorful sunrise and from there we go completely overcast so i would not have this harsh light coming through and at this moment i would go and look for some uh waterfalls or some macro photography because in this case the lights work as like a, uh, the, the clouds work as a light diffuser so you have this really diffuse light out there and you have uh it's perfect to see waterfalls do some long exposures but around three like around like an hour or an hour before the sunrise the skies would open and it would be beautiful, just like maybe 50% covered of clouds. And once again, we have this very colorful uh, sunset, sunrise, sunset, sorry, sunset. 
but that's not reality. So the best day to be out there is the day you can go. You just you just go outside and you just uh, enjoy yourself and you work with whatever is out there. If it's a cloudy day, it's a sunrise. Maybe you do a long exposure and you make a black and white, there a black and white uh, image, very moody, where you have all this movement of the clouds and it, you focus on the textures of the rocks or the trees or whatever is around you. It is a sunny day with really harsh light. You have to adapt yourself. You're gonna do. You're gonna look for something that requires really strong contrast between the shadows and the light. So. The perfect day is just the day you have to go outside, and the perfect location is the location you are. There's no excuse. I I, I feel like photographer that has no excuse. Yes, I'm a landscape <laughs> photographer, and I would love to live in the mountains and take like beautiful landscape images all day. But that's not reality. So we have to adapt ourselves. Mm. Okay, I have another question here. It says, how long on average does it take you to edit a photo? So this uh, this question is very interesting because it's, uh, my post-processing steps has been changing a lot. And I'm using this time that I have inside to try to perfect it, uh, like every step of my post-processing. So before I would say, it would take maybe 35 to 40 minutes to do an image between Lightroom and Photoshop and Lightroom and Photoshop. And I, I almost like recently, I was learning so many different techniques that I felt the image was starting to lose their, their character. I was saying, oh, this is just too much. This is just too much color. It's just too much contrast. So I tried to step back a little bit and create something that I feel more natural so in that that means I'm doing less in my image. So I'm just like I'm really being conscious about what I'm doing with my image before starting my post processing, and just focusing and not not get lost and just do all the time. So now, I would say that my post processing is taking like 15 to 20 minutes if the image is if you don't have to do a lot of work on the image, mm -hmm. but usually it's 10 to 15 to 20 minutes for sure. You know, and it is so interesting. Each photographer has their own style when it comes to digital editing. And you mentioned Photoshop artists. Um, one of our photographers that we represent, Lee C., he is that. <laughs> and he will spend, I think, one of his composite images that has something like 100 images within one image takes him an entire week of work, like 40 yeah. hours a week or something. So, you know, it's just, everyone will have a different answer, but like you said, your personal style is trying to keep it as pure or true to the nature scene you actually saw as possible. And so yeah. um, that time frame makes sense for your style, so. Yeah, and listen, it is, there's nothing wrong to take like hours and hours, there's a few images there is an image actually that I took, and I took this image when I was, it's a recent, when my recent trip to Foz de Iguazu in Brazil, and it was a panorama, and I had, I don't know, I think it was 10 images to create one big panoramic image, and I, in that image, I had like an ND filter on that, so the, the color, the color balance was really all off, and there was a few parts of the, the image that was like a little, it was not as crispy. So I have to look for, like, I have to go through all the images to find a, 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 a suitable thing that I could actually replace there. So of course, like there is a few images gonna take like an hour, two hours, but usually I try to keep it between 10 and 15 minutes. And if you have the skills to do like amazing work in Photoshop, I, I take my hat to you more power to you because it is an amazing tool if you know how to use it. Mm. So I'm going to, unless we have more questions coming in here. Okay, no, it looks like that's pretty much it. So um, Diego, before we end our call today, were there any last little tidbits you wanted to give the audience at all? Yeah, so uh, first, I think this is fantastic. I, I really appreciate everyone that took their time to be here with us and 
asking those questions, I, I even though I don't have, I don't know your guys' face, I really appreciate uh, your time, your attention. And if I, if you have an, if you had a question that you didn't manage to ask in the live chat, you can. Let's see, let's see. Uh, this one, no, this one. It's always the opposite. You can actually contact me here on my email. This is my website. You can go there and you can ask me any questions. And I try to get back to everyone. You can find me on the MK Vision Galleries too. There is a few of my images there. And I'm also on Instagram. So if you want to connect and ask me questions, like feel free. I'm, I try to be as friendly as possible. And I, I, I I'm one of those people I never really hide anything that I know. If you ask me something, I'm gonna be very honest in sharing. Yes, and actually I was going to mention as we kind of sign out here, um, we just are really grateful to be working with you specifically, Diego, because you are so generous with sharing your knowledge, your expertise. Um, you just like to share what you know and uh, is it safe to say you you geek out on technical stuff? So it's nice that we can hear it filtered through you. And um, I think you're an excellent teacher. So we're excited. We're looking forward to the future webinars that are more targeted. Uh, and um, otherwise, um, we just, yeah, we're so grateful you all tuned in. Um, and we just hope you all are staying healthy uh, physically and also mentally. <laughs> and perhaps focusing on photography while we're all cooped up will be a fun thing for some of you uh, to dive in a little deeper too. So yeah. I think that's all we have for today. That's perfect. So once again, thank you all. Keep creating. Don't stop. Don't let this uh, hinder 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 i don't know if that's the right <laughs> word it might be don't let this stop you creating don't let this it is really hard time it, it can be really hard for families to be like socially distant and all of this but try to make the best with what you have in hand and i'm very very thankful for everyone and hopefully we're gonna see you guys in the future webinars right kelsey yes sir all right. Thanks, everyone. Okay. See you guys. Bye. Bye.